Welcome to the Spiritual Transformation Podcast. If you're new to the show, I'm your host, Mary Beth, founder of Day One Life Coaching. I'm a spiritual and transformational life coach. And this channel is an extension of my practice where I have the privilege of talking to a, an amazing new guest every week. And this week I have on Nicole Kerr and she has a wonderful, I read her book, You Are Deathless. And it's her near death experience story. And it has so many practical tips along with amazing spiritual lessons that we all need to learn and apply to our life. So hang in there. You're going to absolutely love this episode with Nicole. Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you for being oh. here. Oh, Mary Beth, thank you so much. I'm very excited and grateful and looking forward to our discussion today. I am too. And um, Nicole is someone who, uh, like, like you say on your book, uh, you, you had this near-death experience. I think the way, you, the way you worded it is it helped you to live fully and not fear death. Like, you know, it's interesting that almost dying is what helped you to live. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, um, that's the truth, because I was raised in a belief system with a God that was dual, you know, so uh, God was loving, and you also feared God, and there were rules, and if you didn't follow the rules, you were bad. This is a Southern Baptist, and this is Lutheran, I was raised, and this is Catholic, and most of the Protestant religions all believe this about God, so I always grew up in fear that I wasn't doing, I wasn't good enough, because my prayer prayers wouldn't be answered. And I was just told, well, you didn't pray the right way. You know, no. did you get on, did you get on your knees? Like the prayer position is going to actually make the difference, you know? And, and what I realized after my um, near-death experience and 20 years later, my memory coming back is that God is not a vending machine. And that is the way that I was raised is that if I was good enough and followed the rules and did what I was told that everything in my life would work out well, I, you know, and the truth of it is, is that's not, that's a falsehood. It's, it's a limiting belief system that is just not true. And it's designed to keep you in fear and any religion, in, um, any organization that, um, uh, says there's a God, uh, but you have to fear that God. In my experience, that is not of God. God is not about fear at all. That's a man-made concept designed to keep you from being the being that you were born to be. And it keeps you at a low vibration as well. And it keeps you from having clarity. When you're in fear, you're operating out of your amygdala, that part of your brain that's always in fight, flight, or fear and scared. You're scared. So, you know, you've got, that's that sympathetic part of your nervous system. And you've got to get it to that parasympathetic to calm yourself down so you can rest and digest. But if you're living in fear, and if you're programmed at a really early age, that something bad, you're going to go to hell if you're a bad person, you're going to be eternally separated from your parents, you know, all of these things that scare the wee wee out of us kids, you know, it really is you grow up fear based. Yeah. And then if you don't deal with that, that operating system in your brain is going to continue to the day you pass on. And if you still believe that you're going to die in fear of death. And that is what I want people most of all to know is that you do not need to fear death. Death is a heavy topic. I'm going to go ahead and grant you that. Most people do not like talking about it. Sure. it. It makes you think about mortality. But here's the deal. We never know when our last day on earth is going to be. And if we could actually live with the awareness uh, that we could die today, we would all be more present, and we would live in a more deeper, loving, meaningful way. Because if I knew this was the last time I was going to see you, I wouldn't be angry at you. I would be loving. I would be kind. And the world would be a whole different place. But we don't think about that. Oh, we could die today. You know, we just don't think it's going to happen to us. We're really a culture of death denial. And, you know, a lot of writers even write that death is about doom and gloom and that there has this um, cloud of depression and negativity surrounding death and my own experience and hundreds and thousands of other people that have had near death experiences, it's a hundred percent different. Death is absolute beauty. It's loving kindness. 
it's this beautiful light and love and this peace that passes all understanding. And so I want us to change the narrative around death. I want us to start talking about it because guess what? It's going to happen to every single one of us. It's the okay. only thing for all 8 billion people on this earth. It's a given that you are going to die. It used to be death and taxes, but a lot of people <laughs> are getting out of paying taxes. So, um, you yes, know, you. you're going to die. So why are we so scared to talk about it? Why are we scared to actually, you know, uh, tell people what it is that we believe is going to happen to us or, um, you know, do a living will, do a, a will, you know, and let people know what your wishes are. What do you want when, when your death happens? Because I certainly didn't think I was going to die at 19 years old. I mean, nobody does. But yet there, we're in a, in a society today that, um, especially with um, the onslaught of mass, uh, mass shootings happening, you really don't know uh, when your time is going to come. It's so true. And you gave me full body goosebumps several times during that. Yeah. I'm in, and we're very like-minded and I also agree like that fear is just the illusion and everything is actually love-based. And, and I had a, we were talking before we started recording about when I was 18 and I was obsessed with reading near death experience stories. And, um, the first one I read actually gave me, I had a spiritually transformative experience where I, it was, it was kind of like having an NDE without leaving my body. And it was amazing. And so I came to all of the same lessons that we're going to discuss later to, so people can really understand this and, and learn that we are deathless. And I'm going to go ahead and read your little short bio real quick, just so people know a little bit about sure. your background. And then we'll get right into like, I guess we should talk about the crash and what happened at that young age of 19. So, okay. Award-winning health expert and national best-selling author, Nicole Kerr, has appeared on CNN, PBS, CBS, ABC, the Food Channel, and a host of other TV and radio shows to share her unique perspective on wellness, nutrition, and spirituality. For the past 30 years, Nicole has worked in all sectors of society, including government, the CDC, nonprofit, military, academia, healthcare institutions, and hospitals, corporate settings, and private consultations. Today, she is pursuing her vocation as e eternality, eternality advocate. Say that for yeah. me. Etern e eternality advocate. That's a tongue twister. Yeah. And <laughs> public speaker. She, she's better at speaking than I am, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> she is 100% disabled veteran, registered dietitian nutritionist, neuro emotional technique certified, NET, and I, I want to talk about that too. That's pretty cool. Energy medicine student, and her favorite credential is BTDT, which has been there, done that. Um, and then I'm going to have all of Nicole's links to reach out to her, her website. Um, she's got so much amazing information to share um and we're going to get into a lot of it during this hour but she also do you, do you offer coaching right now no no i'm taking a sabbatical and i'm just doing my vocation which is promoting the book okay and i want you i want anybody can take that credential btdt and i put it on my book so if you guys can see it okay btdt because sometimes I really believe your experience is worth more than all the education and book reading and theory that you could take. And that is my credential for, for talking to you guys about a near-death experience is I went through it. And so there's a lot of research out on it now, but it's the people that have actually gone to the other side and come back or had a, um, you know, an out-of-body experience, an OBE is what that's called, or a spiritually transformed formative experience that really know that this isn't something that science can quantify. Right. And, and so take that if you've had something that's happened to you and put it on your resume. Absolutely. And I agree because, you know, I've had, I've got all the education and like nine certifications at this point, but it's, I couldn't do this without my life experience. You know, I, I, I didn't become a life coach till my forties because 
I didn't have, I just don't even know how people would do that. Like you need to have the experience first and the education is, is, is totally different than living it. Right. Absolutely. So, um, so what I would like to talk about first is let's go back to, is it 1983? Was that when the crash happened? Yeah. Um, just so, so I know your whole story, but let's let the viewers know at least a little bit about what you were doing back in 1983 as an air force cadet. And let's talk yeah. about Nate in the little, the little red Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a big red fork of Corvette. Big red Corvette. <laughs> yes. Um, I was 19- just thinking of the song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, bless you, Prince. Um, you know, I was a cadet, yes, a female cadet at the United States Air Force Academy, and they had just admitted women to the service academy. So I was one of the first classes. And I tell you guys right now, the only reason I was there is to please my dad. I am a recovering people pleaser. It's an identity that served me when I was little growing up, um, but it has sabotaged and hampered and actually caused me a lot of um, suffering um, as I continue to be an adult and still try to please my parents and other people who are just not capable of being pleased no matter what I do. So um, if that's an identity you're dealing with, we can talk about that later. But I went because I was the second of four children. I was a disappointment because I was a girl instead of a boy and he wanted a boy and it 10 and a half pounds. He was sure that it was a boy. You don't come out weighing that much and turn out to be a girl. So, um, you know, I wanted to be daddy's girl. So nothing in my high school and junior high years would say this girl's going to the military. I was in ballet. I was on drill team or, you know, like rockets drill team, not military ROTC. I was in junior achievement. I was on the paper staff writing. You know, I never did anything. I was not in any varsity sports um, to, to say, okay, I, I love flying and I love the military and I want to go and be, you know, an officer in the armed forces, but I did it because my dad graduated from the Academy and he, uh, cross commissioned into the Marine Corps and, uh, wanted one of his kids to follow in his legacy. And I knew that that I was going to be the only one. And so, I applied and to my shock, I got accepted. (laughs) And I I can tell you the first day that I got to the Academy, you know, they cut your hair off. They, they issue you everything. I mean, I had been a model. I had been a 17 magazine representative from the state of Mississippi. I had gone up there like I was going to college. I had new makeup. I had all this stuff and they took it all away from me. And the only thing they let me keep was my bra. They even issued me underwear, those Granny Smith underwear. Okay. So (laughs) we, didn't I was shocked and they cut my hair off and you know it was like the the shock of being just uh yelled at all the time and I knew boot camp was going to be hard but I didn't realize how abusive it was Mm. and the power that the upperclassmen have and how they want to because it was done to them their first year there they want to turn around and do it to the next group that comes in. So very verbally, uh, mentally, emotionally uh, abusive and also being a female sexually abusive. And Mm -hmm. I knew my soul was in the right, wrong place. But in our family, I don't know about yours, Mary Beth, but quitting was not an option. You know, failure is not allowed. And Mm -hmm. to go through that long, arduous process to, to get accepted into the service academies, I couldn't quit. The shame, the humiliation, the less than that good enough feeling, embarrassment of letting down my father and all these people, you know, like, oh, Nicole, it's so it's a special honor to get selected to go. I mean, no doubt about it, but it just was the wrong place for me and my soul. And I could not admit that to myself and quit, which is what I needed to do. And I didn't have permission from my parents to do that. If they would have said, Nicole, if this isn't right for you, you feel free to quit. You know, we don't want you to 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 be in a place where you're not happy or you're just what you want to do. But no, it was just full speed on. And so I got through the first, first year. I don't know how, but I did. And then the second year, I was it, it, the stakes get higher each year, yeah. you know, and I was going I, I can't keep doing this. I was living in fear every single day. And so um, at the beginning of the school year, we had a squadron event and we had to get uh, rides uh, uh, back from this event. And so 
Um, I got a ride with a senior who we were the last to leave the event and they had allowed drinking at the event and I did not know this guy very well and he had a Corvette convertible so I was like wow I'm gonna have some fun <laughs> and y'all and y'all have to know this about me I had never gone on a date here I'm going to a school with 4,000 guys and my dad was like no dating his <laughs> rules were no, no dating cadets no smoking and drinking okay so in essence no fun and right. uh and so I felt like okay I'm gonna go I'm gonna just take a ride back with this guy, you know, what's the harm? Well, he had a different agenda. He wanted to stop and have a couple more beers, have a cigarette. And later I realized to make out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was worried about our curfew time, which we did not make and we would have not made it um, anyway. And so uh, unfortunately he was drunk and I didn't know that. And this is what happened. And this was a 1965 Corvette convertible. This is the passenger side. And um, I will tell you right now that uh, I don't remember the crash. Uh, I just remember getting in the car after we stopped to look at the Rocky Mountains. And um, then I wound up uh, waking up in the ICU, which was about 12 hours later. And I uh, only know what happened was is because um, the paramedic that arrived on the scene, the EMT, they got there 10 to 13 minutes uh, after the crash. Uh, some bystanders heard the crash. We hit a boulder uh, and the car flipped and we both went flying out and they couldn't get, the, the bystanders ran out of the house, called 911. They could not get any vitals on me. So they went inside and got a blanket and covered me up. Uh, the, uh, the driver was minimally injured. And, um, then when the first responders got there, uh, the EMT took over, couldn't get any vitals on me as well. So the only thing left for him to do was to do something called a sternal knuckle press, which is designed to elicit pain in the body. And the one thing that happened to me was my right pupil dilated and flinched. That was the only sign of life in my entire body that he got. And so he knew I was alive. And I tell people at that point, he got mass pants on me to push all the blood up to my organs, got me in the bus, and they wound up doing CPR on me the entire 20 minutes it took to get me to the nearest community hospital that was not equipped to deal with trauma. And anybody knows CPR, that's a long time to do CPR. Mm -hmm. But I tell people, have you heard that saying, our eyes are the window to our soul? Yes. Okay. When my soul left, it left. I know this because 19 years later, my memory came back and it was very detailed about the crash. And I write about it in the book, how I went through the windshield and I went up in the air and I knew when I got in the air, I looked down and I knew I was going to die. And I cried out, Oh my God, help me. And at that point, an angel came down and took me up. So I never hit the pavement. I never felt any pain or, or any of those injuries, um, none of that. And most people that, that have near-death experiences or that die from an impact of a crash, they never feel the pain. I right. really want people to know that there's no pain that is felt. You can and exit. And a lot of people remember exiting through the crown. Well, you have an energy body. We all have an energy body and it cracks open upon death from the top down and your soul goes out. So yeah. that's what happened to me. And so I was taken to heaven, the other realm, whatever you want to call it by this angel. And I could see what was going on down there below. I could see my body. Um, and then this angel told me that my message was to going to be to tell people not to be afraid of death. And I heard two angels talking next to me and they were talking about how we as humans need to ask them for help that because of free will, we have a choice, but they exist and they want to help us and they're there to help us. And we all have at least one guardian angel with us all the time. And that we need to remember, it doesn't matter how small it is to ask our angels for help. We're not in this alone. And so um, my soul had flown out before I hit the payment. And then when I was on the other side and was told I was going to come back, I was like, I don't want to come back. Right. Uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to go back into that body because there's going to be pain and suffering. And I'm going to have to deal with a family that's very religious and very, um, 
disciplinary. And I, I just, I didn't want to live. And I didn't know what my physical condition, I had massive injuries. And so um, my soul at that moment came back in through that right eye. And that is when the EMT was able to get the blood pressure reading me, reading on me of 60 over zero. Now, we know blood pressure is usually 120 over 80. So 60 over zero is still life and death. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why they were working with CPR to just, 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 just try to keep me alive until I could get to the hospital uh, where, where they did have a doctor. She was the first medical female surgeon in Colorado Springs. She was my um, attending doctor through the whole four months of my stay in the hospital there. And just seven weeks in ICU, lots of surgeries. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it, it was very, very harrowing. I um, had a second near death experience, uh, two weeks into an emergency operation where I actually um, coded, it's called code blue in the hospital, your heart stops, they could not get my heart going again, and um, pronounced me dead on the table, and told my parents that I was gone. And I could feel that my spirit had left my body again and the angel caught me and said no you've got to get back in your body you're going to have a mission and I was like oh, I don't want to do this and so um and then my heart started back again and you can't explain these things I mean you just cannot explain yeah. because anybody that knows uh when they put you out uh with surgery with anesthesia I mean you go to sleep you know death is easy it really is you just just yeah, that's what I was going to ask, like, because when like with my STE, when when I was still I was, I never left my body, but I felt this love and pure bliss and connection to everything and everyone. And, and, and when I eventually that wore off after a two week period of, of just this blissfulness, and, and pure unconditional love that you'd I've never felt before or since, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, like that, did you feel that, you know, on the other side? Absolutely. You know, I will tell you, um, when I left my body, God had been all around me. And the only thing that I remembered for all those 19 years was bright white light. And uh, Dr. Raymond Moody, who coined the term NDE, talks about how that's the most common characteristic of NDEers is this uh, brilliant white kind of clear light, it, it doesn't um, blind you, you know, like a deer in the headlights. And it's very soothing. It's very loving. It's very um, comforting. And that is what I remembered. And I asked my surgeon, was that the operating room lights? And she said, no, you were unconscious the whole time. Wow. Um, so it was definitely me um, going through the light to the other side. But um God was in me. God was me. I was God. God was presence and fullness and oneness. But most of all, God was love, pure, no strings attached. Let me repeat that. No strings attached, open arms, unconditional love. And in that state, you know, I had not suddenly received forgiveness from a stern father for my mistakes um, because my mistakes didn't exist. Mm -hmm. that's really important to get your mistakes just don't exist. They never did nothing I had done on earth needed to be weighed or measured. Um, the life I had lived up until that point and left behind, just told a story like one of many that I have lived in different realms. And that's the thing about souls is this isn't our only rodeo. And I honestly felt like an astronaut floating in outer space, just filled with wonder and awe and yeah why would i want to come back from that <laughs> especially to a body that is you know yeah that was, it was so much angled. pain yeah. yeah yeah and continue to this day to have to to manage you know 40 years later continue to have to manage uh issues that's why i'm a 100 percent disabled veteran you know so i can sympathize and empathize with any veterans out there that have to deal with the va system and um right and medical care and um, finding doctors that will take on complex cases um, and dealing with PTSD, which is what only got diagnosed four years ago. Wow. 36 years later, they thought it was, you know, 
clinical depression, anxiety. So, you know, there's, there's so much that I've gone through just in terms of the physical, but the emotional, the mental and the spiritual realm. And I will tell you the spiritual transformation part really kicked in in 2019 when I learned about something called soul loss. Have you ever heard of that? Soul loss. Soul loss, L-O-S-S. Oh, no, no. Or soul fragmentation. Oh, yes, I've heard that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just like we have a physical wound, you know, like your arm breaks or whatever, that's going to require a surgeon or somebody to heal that and it, your body's going to have to heal it. Same thing with mental illness. You're going to need maybe medication. You're going to need therapy. You're going to need some kind of intervention to help with the mental illness. There's something called soul loss as well, or soul wound. And I didn't know that. And I really wish I had, I think it would, I know it would have helped speed up my healing process, but um, I actually went to see a shaman and he did a soul retrieval. Mm -hmm. And there's three characteristics that I just briefly want to go over because this is really important. If you're still suffering and you have tried so many different things, um, hypnotherapy can work on this. Um, you can call your soul parts back, but when trauma happens, your body will, the soul will fragment. Okay. And pieces of it leave. And it does that in order to protect you. And you may think, why would it do that? But it's so, the trauma is so horrific that if you had to deal with it all coming back at one time, you would probably wind up in, in, in a mental institution. Right. So um, the first symptom is you don't want to be here. You don't want to be on earth. And I knew this when I didn't want to come back. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I was told I had to come back. I had a mission and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, that's a pretty big mission to tell people not to be afraid of death. That's a big topic. <laughs> um, and then the second one is a low level consistent feeling that something is missing. Okay. And it's interesting to me to know that many compulsive behaviors and addictions actually fall into this statement. And I can clearly see now the link that I have between I developed compulsive overeating back in the 80s because my parents did not believe in mental health help. Mm -hmm. Back then, um, the doctor, when I was discharged, said Nicole needs psychological uh, help. She's been through a massive trauma and she needs help with it. And so they said, Jesus is our psychiatrist and she'll be just fine. And I'm going to tell you that that's not what happened. Jesus never came down and sat on the uh, couch and we had a discussion about the trauma or how to fix it. And instead, <laughs> your body is going to maladapt to trauma if you don't get help with it. And in my case, it developed into an eating disorder. And back in the mid 80s, uh, there wasn't much known about eating disorders. It was called compulsive eating back then. Today, it's known as binge eating disorder. And I will tell you, Mary Beth, I suffered with that for 20 years because of the, the blame of my parents saying, you deserve this because you broke your father's rules and therefore you broke God's rules. Uh, never mind, the guy was charged by the state of Colorado with vehicular assault and drunk driving and pled guilty. So clearly I wasn't to blame, right. but I took on that right. and it was, and that is, something that I have had to work through and to get myself out of that victim status of, yeah, I, I, I did this to myself. Um, so that, that's, um, the second one. And the third one is you can't get over it. Okay. And this can manifest like as, uh, a chronic illness or wasting illness. Um, and in my case, uh, I, I was just hypervigilant all the time about keeping myself safe. So nothing bad would ever happen to me again. I bought into this illusion that if I could control my life, nothing bad would happen. Right. So I'm like, I'm going to drive the car. I'm going to, you know, all these rules I put on myself so that I could theoretically keep myself safe. And we all know, we don't all know this, but it's an illusion that right. you can control everything. There's very few things actually that we can control and controlling what you were, where, what you can eat actually was the way mine manifested. And so I went into the field of nutrition, became a dietitian because I thought I could fix myself and my own eating disorder. And I think a lot of us do that. We go into professions where we have the issue thinking if we can get the knowledge and the expertise, then we can help ourselves. 
And well, that's why I'm an addiction. One of the my main niches is addiction recovery coach. And honestly, it's interesting you're saying all this because I my addiction started after my spiritually transformative experience. Like when I came down, I got really depressed. I didn't know how to integrate it. I was yeah. this wasn't even a thing back when I was 18. There was no internet. Like I couldn't, you know, connect with anybody. No, everyone thought I was crazy who I tried to tell. And I started to, the only way I could like try to feel any type of connection to anyone is drinking alcohol back then. And, um, and then I did get food addiction as well, you know, and does that, like you said earlier, trying to fill a void. And I, I've been so, uh, alcohol free for about a little over four and a half years now. And like, so I, it stayed with me, you know, like it, it is, it's a journey and, you, like you said, you know, you're still processing some things that happened back then. That makes me feel better because I also, I had body dysmorphia and, and like, it's a control thing. Like you said, yes. it's a control thing. And addictions are also, we're trying to control, we want relief, you know, we want to feel connected. And they say the opposite of addiction um, is connection. Yeah. It's the emptiness that I didn't want to feel the loneliness. And, you know, when you're being vulnerable with someone and they don't respond with being vulnerable themselves, they just write, uh, gotcha, good job, or, or just something really kind of cold or um, tepid in reply, you feel unsafe. Mm -hmm. And yet you keep putting yourself out there to people that are not really vulnerable. And a lot of this is family and you keep getting the same hurt and the same feeling of, aloneness because they're not matching that vulnerability. So you have to quit being vulnerable with people who are not going to return that state of vulnerability because it keeps you in that fight flight fear of feeling unsafe. And then you feel alone because they didn't get it or they didn't. Or you understand. feel crazy, you know, yeah. like yeah. Gets yeah. Me and it, yeah. you don't feel like anyone, you can relate to anybody. Yeah. And I will tell you, there's a great book out called um, The Body Keeps the Score with Dr. Bessel van der Kolf. And in it, he talks about how your body is going to remember and store all of these things that happen to it. And I questioned my doctor at nine, 19 years later, is my memory coming back? You know, I'm driving to work at the CD, to the CDC and stop at Starbucks and get my usual. All of a sudden, I have a complete flash black, how I'm sitting in the Corvette. No wonder I had the injuries I, that I had. It all made sense. Then I I saw myself, you know, it, it was like a movie, you know, I hit the side of the boulder, the car flipped over, I went out and, and it, it was just like, oh my gosh. And, um, and bits and pieces have continued to come up. And I believe, and people say, well, why did it take 19 years for you to remember? <laughs> you know, because some people still don't remember. And I said, A, your body has to feel safe. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for 20, almost 20 years, I had an eating disorder where I didn't trust my body. I didn't feel safe with my body. Okay. I didn't love my body. I kept judging it and criticizing it instead of being compassionate and loving and thanking it for, for, for getting me through what it's gotten me through. I was always caught up in the image of what we were supposed to be looking like as, you know, uh, beautiful Southern girls or just the image that America creates of beauty, you know? Right. Um, and so um, I was like, okay, support. At that point, 20 years later, I finally had it. Safety, okay? The support part was I found a group. I got into therapy and started meeting people that were like, you need to deal with your trauma. You need help. You need support. You need to be uh, affirmed. You need to be validated. You don't need people criticizing and judging and questioning your memory. And that is probably one of the worst things is when something comes up, and this happens a lot with sexual abuse, is you'll remember it years later. And then people are like, well, you know, you're just making that up. Right. Why didn't you, why didn't you remember that, you know, after it happened or why didn't you do anything about you're creating it? creating false memories. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, and that's just, I'm going to call that out. That's just bullshit. You know, your body will tell you your story when it's safe and you can remember. And also I believe in not only angels, we all have angels. They come in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have guides, spiritual guides that we have access to. And my guides were like, it's time that you remember the story because you have a mission and it's time for you to get this mission underway. And it took me another two decades to keep going and processing through the emotional part because I was very much black and white, uh, raised in a home where there's a lot of discipline that went into the military, which is black or white. They don't really want you to have a gray area of emotions. So I was really disconnected. I thought my emotions with my brain, you know, yeah, I can tell I'm angry, but it never got to my body. I never embodied the emotion, which is why I went into NET to connect to that. And that is so important because all of us have repressed emotions, right. uh, situations that happened in our life that we couldn't deal with. And then when we get triggered present day, we're coping like we were at eight years old or 15 years old or 20, and we're not updating our, our consciousness uh, level. <laughs> and understanding that our unconscious is running the show. And that's why we sabotage ourselves. And that's why, you know, with people, when I was working with them with their diets, they'd get triggered and stressed. They wouldn't know what it's about, but that pint of Ben and Jerry sure did sue them. That dopamine hit, yeah. you know, for a little while worked. And I said, unless you deal with the original root issue, you're going to continue to use food as a coping mechanism or kind whatever. Fill that void all the time. Yeah, whatever's going to put you, I call it a trance, you know, whether it's it's eating or alcohol or drugs or, you know, even shopping, uh, all these compulsive activities, uh, Netflix, binging, whatever, that you just escape and you don't have to think about it or feel it. Uh, yeah, so. I, call, I call it numbing out. And yeah. and, and this is my, my co-host is here, um, TJ the cat. TJ, yeah. He, he's TJ. the one, he's the one, he's knocking stuff off the, the you know, and, and my son was supposed to get, take him away from me, but somehow he got out here. So that's, that's the noise that you're hearing in the background. So I, I think, he's, I, I think he's leaving now. Okay. We're safe. We're safe. Um, so yeah, no, that is, I'm so glad that you brought all that up because trauma and addictions and all these control issues and anxiety, it's all connected. Yes. It's all connected. Um, a lot of addiction is, is simply people who don't even, a lot of people don't even realize the, the traumas, you know, a lot of it's subconscious, like, like you, you didn't remember. And then, yeah, it's, it, I'm really glad you brought that up. And I wanted to say something. I took some notes when I was listening to your book. I got it on Audible. You guys, you can listen to her book on Audible. She reads it herself, and I love it when the author reads their own. Um, but I wrote down, I, I did write down about, since we're on this subject, I, we were talking about the people pleasing, but also generational patterning um, and passing down dysfunctional behaviors. And so I, you, you brought up like all the different ways that we, that could show up in our life. And it just really rang true for me because I'm the truth teller of the family, you know, and I call people out on stuff. But you had mentioned that you had some of this, uh, of the, which ones were yours? Remind me. I wrote down the ones that I identified with the most. Well, I think for me, one of the biggest truths was I realized that God was um, not a vending machine, that God was uh, oh, yeah. love and not fear. And my family of origin is all really steeped in religion where you have to believe in Jesus in order to get to God. And so it's been very difficult for me because they simply don't believe my experience or my truth. And, um, and I really have had a hard time um, accepting that that's just who they are and their belief systems. And um, so, you know, I think um, the people pleasing identity, I had to surrender that. And you realize how you pretzel yourself into all these contortions to try to make your mother happy. You know, we were raised to not hurt your mother. Don't make your mother or dad angry. All these um, these messages and beliefs that you were told, you know, and the truth is, is they're just emotions and you need to allow them to move through you and to not hurt someone, if you keep it in the, I feel when you did this, that, or the other, you're not hurting them, but it's, it's, um, it's really interesting when you start using your voice 
which I started doing and speaking my truth that um, there was not, uh, uh, there was more distance in the relationships. And um, unfortunately, uh, I don't have any communication uh, with my parents now. And, you know, my siblings, um, they are very tepid about my experience, don't really want to talk about it, you know. Uh, so that's that's probably been one of the hardest things because um, your family were taught is there for you for everything, you know, and they're, um, and what I realized is I didn't want to be alone. I'd rather have something than nothing, you know. Right, right. And um, so that that was really hard for me, but I really appreciate the lessons that the NDE has taught me and has taught several other hundreds of thousands of people, and they're all positive. And I wish we would start talking, uh, change the narrative about death in this country. And that's why I want my book, You Are Deathless, and I'll just put it up here. I want it to be a book club book because oh, yeah. there are, there are Questions Where's Oprah? In the back. We need Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are questions in the back about uh, for book clubs and there's a fear checklist. But I want us to start discussing this because it really does help take the fear out of it. And I will tell you, your beliefs about God shape your relationship with death. But the lessons that we have learned through science, this comes through the uh, 2020 annual report from the International Association of Near-Death Studies, they're all like good things. And so we don't need to fear death because if we're living with this fear of death, we're not truly living. We're not going to really live life. We're going to be scared. We're not going to take right. risks. So the first one is we don't die. We don't die. And, okay. Now, yes, this physical vessel that's carrying us around is going to die. It's going to decay. Our avatar. I call it our avatar. Yes, it's going to go away. And guess what? What remains is that soul, that spirit. But most of us don't even know what our soul is. We don't have a relationship with it. So I encourage people. I got this from Lee Harris, who says, when you're journaling, start at the top and write, what does my soul want to tell me today? And then just see what happens. And if you get nothing, do it again the next day. But start having this dialogue or you can just, you know, uh, ask your soul, soul, um, soul, you know, what is it that I need to know um, today? Please reveal that to me in a way that I can get the message. OK, and you can ask for ease and grace with it. because Sometimes some of us have to get pretty hit on the head pretty hard to get some messages. Well, and, and like you said about inviting the angels and guides, because it's a free will planet. So we have to remember like they want to help us, but they also need to be invited. And so I invite my angels and guides into my day every day, every day. Yes. First thing that I do. <laughs> yeah. And if you do that, you kind of got your day cleared. They're going to be exactly. with you. You got yourself <laughs> covered. But I will also tell you, if you're in a lot of fear and a lot of worry, those are very low vibration emotions that keeps spirit from being able to get to you. Block it. Yeah. yeah, you block it. So the second one is love is all that matters and the source of all that exists. Well, there's God, the source of all that exists. God, creators, whatever you want to call it, it's an energy, okay? There's nowhere that God is not. It is not a persona. It's not a man with a white beard sitting on the other side judging us. That is a story that was manufactured to keep people in fear and does not exist. And, and disempowered. Billy Carson, I don't know if you know who Billy Carson is, but he said, God is a frequency and it's our job to tune into him. Yes. Tune into yes. it, the frequency. Yeah. Um, one of the other ones that I love is we're never judged. Because yes. we are taught uh, as little ones, if you are in a religion, that you're going to be judged if you do not follow the Ten Commandments, if you do not follow the church's additional commandments. Each church has their own. Um, and when I got to the other side, that's what I talked about, is there are no mistakes. Now, I will tell you, you're going to have a life review. And that is when... Um, we learn how everything that we said and we did and we thought during our physical life 
impacted ourselves, others, and the world. Mm -hmm. So and what you feel it, you feel the feelings of the other people. That's exactly I, right. When I learned about that back when I, like, I was different because I'm like, now I think about things, wait, do I want to feel this later <laughs> during my life review? <laughs> Nothing keeps you more moral than knowing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, you're right. You're going to feel the feelings of the person that you did it to. Okay. Yeah. So it's not a judgment, but it's making you switch places. So it's learning we're learning. That's how you that's learn. Right. That's right. And that's why these, these are lessons, 10 lessons, and you can find them on my website or you can find them in the book, or you can go on the INDS website. But if we could learn and practice these lessons now you don't have to die like I did to get these lessons, right. you know, um, we're never alone. You know, people may think that during COVID they were freaked out. People were dying alone, you know, well, they may not have had a physical person in there with them, but when we are in the process of dying, uh, we have our angels that come in. We have deceased loved ones that come in. I will tell you your pets are on the other side as well. Um, deceased loved ones, these people start to come in and they help you go and make your transition to the other side. Okay. So it's the spiritual realm that is a very thin veil between uh, earth and the, the spiritual realm. Um, but they are always with us and you can ask for help and you can ask for communication with, um, deceased loved ones with spirit guides with angels you know it's it's a whole different way of relating and we were never taught that in church you know so uh we couldn't have direct contact with these beings you know uh, you always had to go through someone and that's not true at all it's all within you we all are this eternal spark of god with the judgment thing, um, so I, I, I've had psychics on here. I have a lot of friends who are psychics. I've had crazy spiritual experiences my entire life, like since I was like three. So I've never like doubted any of this. But um, uh, uh, my mom died on Christmas Day a little over two years ago. And um, one of my friends who channels, she just showed up to my mom. My, my mom showed up to my friend. And she basically was channeling this stuff about, she said, that your mom wants to apologize. She didn't realize until she went through her life review how judgmental she was of you and that how much it like because she she wouldn't have described herself that way, you know, when she was here in 3D physical reality, she wouldn't have called herself right. judgy. But then when she had to go through the life review, she realized that the judgment was actually the exact thing that was keeping us from being closer as mother and daughter. And, you know, I was like, man i needed to hear that because that's true because i didn't feel like i could just tell her anything or i was afraid of being judged i was afraid of her worrying too because she was a big worry person and um you know that's one of the patterns the generational patterns that i needed to um really break because that conditioned worrying puts us in that fear and then it creates a low vibration right so wow reprogramming our brains is 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 a lifelong <laughs> journey and it's a lot of work. I'm not going to yeah. sit here and, and uh, make it all out to be all this great greatness. It's a lot of work. Uh, it's um, it's painful. There is suffering. It's not easy to to deal with um, your truths that start coming to you and then to let others know and speak your truth and your voice. But you have to remember, you came here as an individual being. You are not... Uh, to be a clone of your mother or your father and you have your own mission here and you need to get on task to start fulfilling that mission and the first key is to become aware of things mm -hmm. and that is the first step in behavior change and to start questioning what is my concept of God? What do I really believe about God's source or whatever? Uh, what do I believe about uh, myself? Am I judging myself every day? Am I shooting myself? Because if I, if you're shooting, take that word out of your vocabulary. That is a very shame-based, low, 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 low vibration. And it doesn't serve you or the kids that you're shaming or anybody that you're shaming. So, um, you know, take it out. What can you say to yourself that's positive? You know, how can you love yourself more? And this is also different parts of you that were harmed, you know, or traumatized. You have to embrace that 19 year old 
girl that didn't know any better, that didn't know any different, you know, she was just trying to have fun, you know, she didn't cause the wreck, she did, she was just a passenger, but, you know, her parents had a different story and she bought that story and it took her a long, long time to realize the truth and to free herself. And at the end of this, that's what you get is freedom, you know, and you find that peace that passes all understanding because you're not being judged. You're not being criticized or um, punished or any of those things that we put us in fear. And what if everybody knew the uh, number three of the common lessons uh, from NDEs was everything and everyone is connected. We talked a little bit about this before we started recording, like how many things could be prevented. And if, if we just realize that that the ripple effect that's happening. Absolutely. And, you know, I talk about this all the time because we have got to change our relationship in this country with one another. We have to learn to respect one another and let go of race, sexual orientation, all these things that we get divided on. You know, when I was in the military, the one thing that they said to us all the time was everyone bleeds red. It does not matter what color you are. It doesn't matter your sexual preference. It doesn't matter anything. When you see a uh, a buddy in theater or you know when you're working with someone who's dying or has a life-threatening injury you're just trying to save that person you don't care about their political uh, uh ideology or any of that kind of stuff you know and if we could get rid of that and know that we are all souls and we're all here to evolve and we're all connected because truly on the other side the main message is love and oneness I'm yes. going to repeat that love and oneness is what is on the other side. So that is part of our journey is to love everyone, love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay. Many of us don't even know our neighbors, but yet we're judging them <laughs> that they're this and that. Okay. So, you know, simple things like that, that we can't even seem to, to want to get right or try to get right. Um, and also our all sentient beings, you know, the way we treat animals, the way, even the, the animals we eat, you know, uh, I'm a nutritionist and I will tell you COVID the first it hit was the poultry industry and the meat packing industry, the hardest. And yet we didn't take the red flags and look at how we were, uh, processing and treating these animals and these, these factories, um, and do something more humane about it. Um, we need to get I, rid of these factories. And cause I do believe that since everything is energy, when we, the, the way the animals are treated that we eat matters. Like we are ingesting the fear of the animals. I believe that wholeheartedly. And, and I, so like, yeah, I only support like local farmers and local, you know, yeah. we got to, we got to quit supporting the big food industry. It's crap and it's awful. Right. Cool. And then mother earth, you know, uh, the way we're treating mother earth, you know, the, the pollutions that we dump on or, you know, even littering with a cigarette butt, when you put, if you're smoking and you put that cigarette out and you don't pick it up and dispose of it property, okay, that means a dog could come by and eat it or you throw oh, it yeah. in, the wa in the water, the reservoir, um, the fish eat it. So we have got to take responsibility and start realizing that our actions have consequences and they're all connected just like the wildfires in Canada it came all the way down to South yes. Carolina affected 183 million Americans that's half over half our population our air our shared resources our water you know all of this is really important and if we don't understand that we are one big it's a cosmic consciousness of a greater oneness and that we all are these souls that come in perfect, but we develop spiritual amnesia as soon as we're born. Yes. We forget who we are as these radiant, glorious, eternal beings, you know, and some people, they never get that their whole life. So it's time for people to start waking up, to start becoming conscious, to start acting responsible and to start dealing with the fact that we are going to die and to have the discussion with your kids. I do want to put in here for single parents, you know, um, I know and my family, my sister's husband passed at a, a young age from ALS and the kids were 10 and 14 and they said, mommy, are you going to die? And she's like, no, I'm healthy. I'm going to be fine. And I 
took the opportunity to tell my sister, you know, you don't really know that there's no guarantee <laughs> that you're not going to have something happen to you. Right. And so wouldn't it be more honest to tell the child, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't anticipate dying, but death can occur at any time. And I could have an accident or be, you know, uh, in a different I state guess. of mind. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, if something like that should happen to me, I want you to know Aunt Nicole and Uncle James are going to take care of you. There's You're going to be provided for. There's money for you. And I'm going to miss you, but there's no intention. And nobody does that. They always say, no, I'm, mommy's not going anywhere. That's exactly right. And they do it to, to make themselves and the children feel better. But if something happens to you, then what is the children, the child left with? Absolute belief that nothing is true anymore, you know, and it's harder on the child if something happens instead of just talking about it and saying, you know, this is what's going to happen if something should happen to me, right. uh, which I don't believe it will, but just so you know. Right. Give and, some reassurance while we're saying this so they, so they don't have anxiety. <laughs> that's, that's right. I mean, yeah. you have to be age appropriate with this, but not to just give this carte blanche, you know, mommy's going to be fine or daddy's going to be fine because that is just so misleading and it's not true. Well, and, 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 and kids are smart. They'll know. Well, that's what I thought about daddy and yeah. what happened. So I know that's, and then, you know, you got that trust versus mistrust time. You know, uh, one of these, I think what we need to teach our kids is number, number eight. This needs to be taught. Our true selves are perfect and we are loved more than we can fathom. What if we taught kids these principles? <laughs> All 10 of these in school, you know, instead of a lot of the, the, the crap that we learn, you know, uh, yeah. wouldn't it be a different world? Yeah. And that's why I'm trying to use my voice. And that's why I came back. And it's been a long journey for me. It's been 40 years, my entire adulthood. Um, and I'm at the point now where I have my truth. And I have the conviction and I have the platform now after writing my book. And I want people to know that they don't have to just accept what the generation before you taught you and the one before that. Because I will tell you, if that generation, like my parents never dealt with their traumas, they didn't believe in mental health. Right. So they have no capacity to have empathy, understanding and sympathy for you and your trauma. You're just supposed to get on with it like they did. Suck it okay? up. <laughs> yep. And so that's why you have to deal with your traumas so that your children don't have that same experience where you're just supposed to get over it. Because no, we're not designed to just get over it. It's going right. to to manifest in um, a negative way. And that is what gets us stuck and gets us in a loop that takes sometimes decades or a lifetime to get out of. Well, I certainly appreciate you fulfilling your mission. And thank you. <laughs> that, that's why I started this podcast, too, is like uh, spiritual teachers and healers, you know, people who help you know, trigger the spiritual transformation in all of us, because like you said, we come into this world with amnesia and, and that's what the spiritual waking is waking up and being like, like when I read that NDE book and I was like, oh yeah, my soul remembered, you know, I yes. was out of my amnesia. That's what I believe happened. Maybe a gift from my higher self, who knows yeah. what happened, but it definitely put me on this trajectory of where I am now. And like, I feel obligated just like you feel obligated. Yeah. To help others understand that we have, we don't die. We are spiritual beings having a human experience, you know, and, and this is, it's a beautiful thing. And didn't you say, well, I know that I've heard it before. It's like a Buddhist saying about pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Oh, sure. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think either you, I, I read it in your book too, maybe, or, but I just wanted to bring that up because it is, it is a choice, you know, and you know that more than anyone you know all the pain you went through and yeah and I still day. go through it I still go through it you know it's not it's not healing is a journey and it's not a linear journey it's not a plus b equals c you know and that's something else I had to learn because I thought if I did everything I was told that it was going to get better or something was going to happen the right way you know and I'm just here to say it's not you know bad and good are earthly terms I really want people to hear that they were created created for us here on earth in 
in order to evaluate ourselves and others. When you get to the other side, there's no such thing as bad and good. Okay. Everything is just great. Mm -hmm. So know that and know that's why you're not going to be judged because there's no bad on the other side. It's we're, we're here to learn and experience and expand and grow. Ex yes. Evolve to our evolve, yes. evolution. Yes. Well, I appreciate your time so much, Nicole, and I'm going to have Thank Nicole's uh, links and definitely get her book. You are deathless by Nicole Kerr, K E R R. Yeah. You can get it here on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble, listen to it on audible. And if you go to my website, www.nicolecurr.com, if you go to You Are Deathless, I put all the pictures in the book on there. So those of you that listen on Audible can see every picture. Which is I'm why I didn't it. see it because I yeah. looked into it. I was like, yeah, I didn't see that picture. Just amazing. Your, your, your story of transformation is beautiful. And I really appreciate you. For, thank um, you. Thank you for having me my on. viewers. Well, and thanks for, you know, validating that, you know, we're, we're really on the same, all of us are on the same journey. It's just, we're on different paths to get there and different. it's not a yes. wrong path, you know? Right. And some of us get there sooner than others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Don't don't judge yourself for how long it's taken. It's okay. Yeah, we'll get there you're, eventually. You're right, you're, you're right where you need to be for today here in this podcast. Absolutely. So thank you to everyone for watching. Please subscribe to this community if you're interested in spiritual transformation stories just like this. I have a new guest like amazing as Nicole every Friday. So thanks again. Please like, please share, and we will see you next Friday. Aloha.